Some of the dialogue is a bit back and forth here this evening and will require us to pay attention as we look at what Jesus is saying to the Jews that were gathered there uh, with him, around him, in the temple, just after the Feast of Tabernacles. So we're reading from verse 30, John chapter 8, verse 30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth ever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Amen. Ending the reading there at verse 47. And may the Lord give light in this portion. Now let's briefly pray once again, all of us. We need the Lord. He requires help. I do. You do. May God be pleased to give it to us. Lord, we publicly and within our own hearts, we, we are quite content to confess our need of thy help and favor. It's one thing to bring a sermon. It's another thing to bring a message. And Lord, we pray that that will be the case tonight, that a message will come to the hearts of those who are gathered here. There are some who are tired in body. Awaken them. Help them to have strength to hear. What a sad case that people may come so weary in body and mind, so spiritually in sleep that they are not alert to hear thy word. This will come as judgment. And we pray mercy. And we'll give a hearing ear. And drive away the powers of darkness and drive away the power of the flesh. Help us to wait upon the Lord and renew our strength. Have mercy then as we look to thy word. And again our cry is, fill us with the Holy Ghost. Help us to make application as is the need within each heart. We pray that thou wilt guide us and give us heavenly wisdom. The very angels themselves, as it were, by the Spirit, come and, and, and bring to us the very words of God that coming from heaven itself will be the message that needs to be proclaimed. Oh, aid us, Lord. Come. And may there be salvation in this house. We pray all this in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. One of the interesting things to note about the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is the difference between his time outside Judea and his time in Judea. When you note that throughout his ministry, you'll find a stark contrast because outside Judea, he was often faced and confronted with demon possession. 
And you will know that as you go through his ministry time through Galilee and various other parts, you'll find that he was often confronted with various forms of of demonic possession that came to him, and he had to cast them out. Nevertheless, when he comes into Judea and ministers among Jerusalem, while we do not see the same demon possession, we still see that Satan's crowd is there. And that is brought forth by the language that we have read together here in John chapter 8. As we go through this, and it's been some weeks now we've been in John 8, we've seen the language of Christ intensify more and more. And he is not softening with them, and he is not turning his back upon them. He is building argument upon argument upon argument as to their need. And while there is a building up of the walls and a refusal to understand fully what he is saying, yet there is this plain stating of Christ to their hearts in order to sweep away all their arguments and every lie that they hide in in and help them to see what they really need to grasp. With the hardness of their hearts, it would have been easier for Christ just to turn and walk away. But that is not what he does. He is so merciful to speak clear language to them. And the unbelief of the Jews is frightening. I must say that. It's absolutely frightening. When you think of the time that Jesus Christ spends in Jerusalem and the long discourses that he gave to them, it is frightening to think that so few understood what he was saying or when they did understand their refusal to believe what he said. It's frightening. Of course, there's nothing new under the sun, and we feel the same today, don't we? As you go out and you deal with your family members, your children, your brothers, your sisters, moms, dads, grandparents, people you work with, neighbors that live around where you live, all of these things are are reminders. Every time we try to share the gospel with them, we are met with resistance, a wall of unbelief that will not succumb without the grace and intervention of God. Christ speaks very harshly to them. Just as a reminder to you, some verses to note. Look at verse 19, when he says to them, Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my father also. Jesus saying there, not as clearly as he's going to say it later on, but you don't know God. You don't know God. And this might be easy for us to read, but if you're a Jew... If you're a Pharisee, if you're standing there in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, hearing the words of someone like Jesus Christ coming in with no apparent credibility as they would put weight upon it, uh, saying words like this, ye neither know me nor my Father, you don't know God the Father, then this is strong language indeed. If you look also at verse 24, see what he says there, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. And if that was not bad enough, he goes on and says, For if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. So he's not just telling them you're going to die in your sins. He's saying that the, the, the deciding factor is me. I'm the deciding factor. I am the one that determines it. If you don't believe me, if you don't understand that I am God, I am the same one that met with Moses in Exodus 3.14 declaring, I am If you don't understand that, you shall die in your sins. Strong language indeed. And also verse 31, after there were a number who made some assent to believe on him, and uh, we'll get to it next week whenever we come again. You'll see uh, again, as I said to you, I don't believe they truly were saved. If you look at verse 45, Um, where it says, And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not, said to the same people, they don't believe, I don't think they're truly saved. We've made that argument before. But look at verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And again, think of that. Their whole life ambition was to continue in the word of who? The word of Moses, the law of Moses. In all that their forefathers had passed down through the ages, their whole desire was to continue in their teaching. And Jesus Christ comes along and says, no, you must continue in my word. Now, we understand that the law of Moses was the, the law of Christ, and Christ spoke it, and Christ gave it. But they didn't fully get that. They didn't understand that, and that becomes more and more clear, even in what we're going to look at tonight. If you continue in my word, if you hear what I say and do it, and continue to do it, 
which is the hard part, isn't it? Without the Spirit of God, how can we continue in the words of Christ? We think of all that He has said, and we know the corruption of our own hearts, the heart being deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and knowing that my heart is prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love, then how am I to continue in His Word except by a baptism of grace and the fullness of the Holy Ghost? And child of God, never forget that's your daily need. That is your daily need. It's not just for those sent to the mission field or for the pastor standing behind the pulpit. You need the infilling of the Spirit, power to live the Christian life, grace to overcome the sins of your own heart, the understanding and perception of where you still fall short that you might confess those sins, get them under the blood and live more like Jesus Christ day by day. We need the Holy Ghost and I hope you're praying because I addressed this a number of weeks ago and put it before you, the need to pray for the infilling of the Spirit. Let me remind you of that. I hope you're doing it. If you're not, get at it. Pray for the Spirit to fill your heart and life. His language as he progresses, continues to upset them in this scene, so much so that by the end of it, in verse 59, they are ready to murder him. At the end of the chapter, then took they up stones to cast at him. They're ready to kill him. That's, that's how he builds argument upon argument, exposing their error, their unbelief, their deception, so much that they are willing to just murder him on the spot. You see how angry they're getting? You're beginning to see? I mean, how angry is someone when they're thinking about murdering someone? Of course, the anger has flared up and has become uncontrollable. And that's what's seething in their hearts as Jesus is saying what he is saying here in these verses. Of course, we should not be surprised when we speak the truth and people respond in this way. Jesus warned in Luke 6, 26, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. <laughs> so when people are speaking well of you all the time, and take this for your encouragement, child of God, if work is hard because people hate the God you serve, then be encouraged. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. That's when you should be worried. Don't be worried when you get up in the morning thinking, what are they going to say now? And how am I going to be treated today? And what are they going to bring against me this week? No, you don't have to be worried about that. Be worried when everybody thinks you're great. You're just wonderful. You're just the whole heart of the party. Well, if you're a Christian, that's very unlikely if everyone else is not a Christian. And Jesus says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. These verses that we have here in John 8, as the language intensifies in its explicit nature toward the Jews, are often hated for what appears to be anti-Semitic language. From verses 39 through 47, the, the accusation is brought by some that this is anti-Semitic. It's wrong. And of course, we would disagree with that. It's not anti-Semitic at all. It's anti-sinner. <laughs> That's what it is. And to isolate the verses and not understand the context, for example, look at verse 34. And realize that what Jesus is saying here to them applies to all of humanity. Whosoever commit a sin is a servant of sin. Everyone is in view here. Now, of course, he addresses his immediate context, doesn't he? There are Jews standing before him. And so he speaks to Jews and warns them of their sin. Nothing wrong with that. You would think it mightily strange if I started to speak words or messages to you that were completely irrelevant to where you are. You would think, well, that was a waste of my time. Jesus Christ is addressing religious Jews, so his message is going to be targeted for religious Jews. But the whole tenor of the New Testament is anti-sinners. It's showing that sinners are, are, are guilty and hell-deserving, that the problem is humanity. The problem is the nature within us all, whether Jew or Gentile. We all have a problem, every one of us. And so when we look at these verses, we might say, well, it's addressed to the Jews. What relevance does it have to me? Well, it has every relevance because it's not just applicable to Jews. It's applicable to all. Every sin that was guilty within the Jewish nation has been found within those who are Gentiles. As we come then to these verses, and we're going to be considering 37 through 44 as God gives us help, 
We're considering this, how to determine you are a child of God. How to determine you are a child of God. Very important. Would you not agree? You're sitting here tonight. How do I know whether I'm a child of God or not? And some of you are very assured. You know, you've been walking with God for a long enough period of time, and he draws near to you day by day, and you're assured of his presence, and you know that the Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are the sons of God. But some, perhaps here tonight, aren't so sure. And you need to be uh, clear about this before we end. How to determine you're a child of God? First of all, you know heritage is spiritually insignificant. You know heritage is spiritually insignificant. Leading on from where we left off last time, verse 37, I know that ye are Abraham's seed. I know that. I'm aware of that. Now, if we compare that with verse 33, where it's the reason why Jesus says what he says in verse 37, we be Abraham's seed. Now, they've said that. And what Jesus says, I know that ye are Abraham's seed. I'm aware of that. And he is not denying the right to lay claim to physical Abrahamic lineage. He's confessing that. He agrees with that. He doesn't deny what is true. However, their boast is in something that is spiritually insignificant. When Jesus goes on to speak here, we're going to find out that it doesn't bear any weight when it comes to knowing God. <laughs> it doesn't make a difference about when it comes to determining whether I'm a child of God or not. If my sole claim is, we be Abraham's seed, it's still deficient. Of course, the Word of God makes this abundantly clear. In Romans chapter 2, the Apostle Paul speaks in no uncertain terms as to the fact that Jews needed something more than their mere heritage and lineage. In Romans 2, verses 28 and 29, he says, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, that is, by the flesh, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter. So this is who a true Jew is. One who's been circumcised in heart, not merely by flesh. Not one who's merely come down through a family line and inherited certain practices such as circumcision. No, that will never do. A true Jew must have something happen in his heart. He must have something that is done by the Spirit. That's what he's saying there. In the Spirit. The Spirit itself must be working. It's not something that you can give. Only the Holy Ghost can give it. I would to God people would get a hold of that. So many are as blind as the Jews were. Paul also argues in, in, in Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, he says, not as though the word of God hath, non, hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. Note that. Just because of the seed of Abraham doesn't make them children, but an Isaac shall thy seed be called, and so on. He, he shows that there's this particular birth that comes by a spiritual work in God's special promise. This is how you become a child of God, not by merely making a claim to be of Abraham's seed. You know that heritage doesn't have any real spiritual significance. And maybe you have certain arguments, and you're as bad as the Jews were. And this was always the case, you know. It was prophesied in Jeremiah 9, 25 and 26, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the circ uncircumcision. Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are in the utmost corners that dwell in the wilderness for all these nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart. You see what the prophet's saying there? He's saying, look, the, the Judah, the seed of Abraham, to use that language, are going to be judged just like all the other nations. Now they are physically uncircumcised, but Israel's problem is they're uncircumcised in heart. Their hearts have never been changed. And so judgment still hangs over them. And this is a problem that is rife, absolutely rife. If you make a boast in something insignificant tonight, maybe you do, I don't know what it is. If you say, I have not been born again, but I've been baptized. I have not been born again, but I attend church, or but I do this, that, or the other. If there's any but, you're not a child of God. You're not. 
That, that's it. For the child of God here tonight, I have been born again. Full stop. Period. That's it. The end. That is my argument. Born again. What does that mean? New birth. Born from above. A heart circumcised by the Spirit. God cutting away the old nature, the old flesh, working it out of me by a miraculous working of the Spirit alone. Bringing, him, bringing me to himself. This is a great need, you know. And it saddens me when people go around and they're content with something lesser than this. Because if it was something that was merely material, it wouldn't matter so much. But eternity is at stake. That's the thing. And why do I stand up here and preach this way week after week? Why? Because eternity is at stake. Why did Jesus Christ intensify his language? Because he just got a kick out of riling the Jews? Eternity is at stake. Souls are going to hell. And they're going to hell blinded with some lie thinking, well, I have something that was in my heritage or I was born in a certain nation or brought into a certain church. Something that's spiritually insignificant. It means nothing to God. You're uncircumcised in heart. How can you determine you're a child of God? Well, those who are the children of God will know that heritage or lineage is spiritually insignificant. But secondly, secondly, you know that obedience is spiritually indispensable. Obedience is spiritually indispensable. There are two parts to this. First of all, obedience doing the word of our Christ's word and then obedience, loving Christ's person. These are the two fold ways in which we see this reflected through this passage. Now, if you look at verse 37 again, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. My word hath no place in you. That is to say it makes no progress with you. When I speak my word, it like hits a brick wall. It doesn't penetrate. It doesn't get into the heart. It goes into the ear and it gets to the brain, and it does enough to get you angry, but it doesn't save. You're not taking it in. You're not imbibing it within your being. You're not saved. My word hath no place in you. I can't find it in you. It makes no way in you. It stops when it hits your unbelief. The child of God is one who obeys Christ's word. And as we progress then into verse 38, it says, I speak that which I have seen with my father. Here's his authority. What is he speaking? He said this language before, so I'm not going to take any time on it. I speak that which I have seen with my father. My exclusive message is a heavenly message. I speak the words of God. I'm not here to just bring poetic language. I'm not here to merely bring wonderful discourses that impress you. I speak the words of God. What did Abraham do? It tells us in verse 39, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. The works of Abraham. Well, what did Abraham do? Well, Abraham obeyed, didn't he? <laughs> now, for one thing, we might go skip forward and look at verse 56 and see what he did. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. That's one thing he did. He looked to the day of Christ, and he was glad. He was glad. He, he longed for that day. And it, the Lord came and ministered unto him, telling him much about that day. And though he could not enter into it and experience it, many times the Lord came and showed Abraham wonderful pictures with greater insight than we give credit for, I think. Greater insight into the gospel than perhaps many even here understand. Abraham knew the truth and rejoiced at the day when Christ would come and be the substitute, be the ram in the place of the sinner. But they didn't. They weren't like Abraham at all. They didn't rejoice in the day of Christ. But more than that, when here's Christ incarnate coming to the Jews and they're rejecting him, and I think there may be an argument to say that what Christ is drawing from here 
and doing the works of Abraham is whenever I went to him, he didn't reject me. If you go back to Genesis chapter 18, you'll see one, one occasion when the Lord came in, a, in the form of a man. Of course, the Lord visited with Abraham on numerous occasions, but here it makes it clear that he appeared unto him as a man. In Genesis 18, verses 1, and the opening few verses we'll read together, and the Lord appeared unto him, Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. And you read on down, you see more and more, for example, verse 13, And the Lord, Jehovah, is there, said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh? It's the Lord. It's Jehovah here in human form. It's a theophany. It's a pre-incarnate visitation from the Son of God. And what do we find? Do we find Abraham being reluctant to bring him in or hospitable? Hospitable. He immediately brings him in along with the two others that are with him, the angels that are with him there. Brings him in, it's hospitable to him, uh, feeds him and so on, listens to what he has to say, takes on board his word, his promise. But this is not what happens when Jesus comes toward the Jews in this time, 2,000 years ago. What we're reading here in John 8, when he came then, they didn't do what Abraham did. They didn't do the works of Abraham. Abraham received me, rejoiced for my day. But you don't. You don't. We're told in Hebrews 11, 8, that Abraham's faith made him obey. And we read in verse 40, But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Abraham didn't do this. He didn't seek to kill me. He didn't turn away from the truth. He took the truth on board. He believed what was told him. And you're not doing the works of Abraham. You're not. You're not carved after his character. You're not like him at all. Though your claims to be his children are great and swelling, Yet there's no proof in the matter. And if you skip down to verse 43, why do ye not understand my speech even because ye cannot hear my word? So here we see ignorance. Ye cannot, ye do not understand my speech. Why don't they understand? Because of unbelief. And again, I'm not going to go back here to show you in previous messages. We, we looked at passages that show that unbelief breeds ignorance. That pride breeds ignorance. And that's why they were ignorant and they could not understand what he was saying. Why do you not understand my speech? You don't believe. You refuse to believe. Even because you cannot hear my word. You won't bear my word. You won't listen to what I'm saying. You see, the child of God here knows that obedience is spiritually indispensable. He must obey. He is compelled to obey. Just like Abraham when the Lord came to Abraham that day, there was no reluctance. There was no wondering, well, should I give any uh, uh, hearing to this individual? No, he fell before him and obeyed what he said. And every time the Lord came to Abraham, every single occasion, he obeyed. He heard him and went and did whatever the word of God was to his soul. And that's what it is for you and me. I trust, oh, let it not be that there's someone here who professes to be a believer and the Lord speaks to your heart, and you don't listen. And you bear out all these excuses as to why you won't hearken. Oh, but, pastor, you don't understand my particular circumstances, the nuances of my situation. You don't get it. You know, I, I would obey that, and I, I, I want to, but, but I'm just not capable of doing it at this present time. That's not the spirit of the children of God. And then the Lord speaks. Isn't it a gracious visitation? Isn't it? Have you ever went through periods when the Lord is silent to you? Have you? Have you gone through weeks and months, maybe even years, where it feels as if God's not speaking? That's an awful place to be. Awful. I would not wish that on anyone. To those who walk in darkness and have no light, even though they fear the name of the Lord. The prophet Isaiah talked about that. It's a horrible place to be in. 
when you hear the Lord, you obey. And so the Spirit shall compel it within your heart. Obedience is doing Christ's word. But also you see obedience is loving Christ's person. Look at verse 41. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then say they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Now what do they mean? Well, there's some debate here. Um, Again, as often as the case. We don't always get perfect agreement. And it seems to come out of nowhere, doesn't it? I mean, this, we be not born of fornication. What is that all about? I mean, where is that coming from? And it may be, it may be, I put it to you, the possibility is that it is arising from this. They are getting a dig at the Lord. He is criticizing where they originate from. He is coming and saying, you're not of Abraham. You're not of Abraham. And in their response, they begin to retaliate. Well, at least we can say this. We're not of fornication. Because that was their understanding of Mary, wouldn't it? She was found with child before she was ever married. And so this man, Jesus, that being known, perhaps, then the accusation is, well, you were born of fornication. We weren't born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Not like you. You're a bastard child. That may be the way that they are applying these words. In which case, we understand it to be an argument against this person. They don't like him, do they? They don't like him. And that becomes more clear whenever Jesus speaks in verse 42. Look at it. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. He would love me. He'd love me. This is the mark, isn't it? Love for Christ's person. Every true child of God here has a love for Christ's person. You do, don't you? I don't need to persuade you about that because it's the most natural thing in the world to love the Lord Jesus Christ. You know without him, you're a hopeless case. You know without him, you have no answer for your sin. You know without him, you're going to go to hell. You love his person. You love him. You know what the wonderful thing is as you grow in maturity too, is that it doesn't just become a ticket out of of hell. It becomes more than that. It's just him. And you grow in love for him. And that's a wonderful way to grow in the Christian life, to mature so it's not just Jesus is my passport out of the judgment of God. No, no, Jesus actually is everything. I love him more and more. As the years go by, I see more glory in him, more beauty in him. I have less resistance to him and I want to obey him more. We love him because he first loved us. And that's true spiritual maturity. To find that, to grow in that, to to, to sense that. And it's not that we get away from the forgiveness of sins. That's always foundational. That's always kind of the fountainhead that that brings joy to our hearts. I am forgiven. But realizing what it cost Christ to bring that forgiveness, as we gaze on him, we see the exceeding greatness of his love. And we trust that on our deathbeds, if God so grants us it, he will lie there and say, My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the pleasures of sin I resign. You're willing to give up everything for him. And you look to that day when the very dew of death is upon your brow. You might be able to say, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, it is now. Loving Christ. They didn't, you see. And this is a defining mark. If you do not exhibit a love for Jesus Christ, I say you are not a Christian. Now, it's very easy to say, I love you. And Christians are the greatest hypocrites <laughs> when we get to singing our hymns and we talk about, you know, singing, we love the Lord, and if ever I loved you, as we were quoting there just a moment ago, it's very easy to say it, even easier to sing it, but far harder to live it out. But this is a mark. And those who are truly born again of the Spirit know that obedience is spiritually indispensable. That this cannot be left to the side. That someone can be saved and not love the Lord or someone can be saved and not obey His Word. Not possible. Simply not possible. 
The true child of God loves the Word and loves the person of Jesus Christ. Loves. Even when it's hard to hear His Word. <laughs> Don't we love that too? Them that the Lord loves, He chastens. And we know when He comes, it's not easy to bear at the time, that's true. No one loves the chastening hand. But in hindsight, we look back and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for correcting me. Thank you for loving me sufficiently to bring me back into the right way. If that's not the case, then if we've never experienced that, it's further proof we've never been saved. Thirdly and finally, how can you determine you're a child of God? Well, you know Satan is spiritually indecent. He is spiritually indecent. You know that. You're aware of that. And your life exhibits that. Look at verse 44. Ear of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar, and the father of it. The child of God knows they can have nothing to do with Satan. Nothing. Or his ways at all. They know that his influence is destructive and they avoid him and all that he would put before him, before them. And that's not the case for the unbeliever. The unbeliever doesn't live that way. The unbeliever doesn't live with a fear of Satan's ways. They don't. They don't. They're not concerned about the ways of Satan. They're not concerned about falling into his ways. Even when it comes to a certain level of morality, it's for their own benefits, for their own pride. And so they'll not do certain things for the sake of their own name. That's it. There are three things here that the Lord points out about Satan that were manifest here in the Jews, and we'll note this here. First of all, he is the original murderer. He makes that plain in verse 44, doesn't he? He was a murderer from the beginning. He was the original murderer. Now I compare that with verse 37. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me. Look at verse 40. But now ye seek to to kill me. You say you're of Abraham, but you're manifesting that which originated in who? The devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. And you want to murder me. And you know what's going to happen at the end. You're going to prove it. Even though I'm telling you that he is a murderer from the beginning and that murder comes from him, originates with him, even with that and me making that plain to you, you're still going to take up stones and try and kill me. Proving my point. Yes, they're, they're showing where they come from. They're showing that they, their hearts were owned by the original murderer, Satan himself. And so they wanted to kill Christ, as verse 37 and 40 make plain. Also is the original rejecter, because it says... Uh, and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. He didn't stay in the truth because there's no truth. He rejects the truth because the truth is not in him. He's the original rejecter. Of course, we find the same spirit among the Jews here, don't we? Again, verse 37. Because my word hath no place in you, you reject my word. Verse 40, again. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. Again, you're rejecting this. You don't want anything to do with this. Look at verse 43 again. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You reject it. And again, Jesus is saying here, look, look what Satan does. He doesn't abide in the truth because there's no truth in him. He rejects it. He shuns it. He wants nothing to do with it. And you're doing the very same. You're doing exactly what manifests the heart of the devil himself. He is the original rejecter. And this is all backing up the language of Jesus Christ, isn't it? Ear of your father, the devil. You're of Satan. He's your true father, not Abraham. He is also the original liar. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, own. For he is a liar and the father of it. And you compare that with verse 39. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto him, them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. You're lying. You're not. You're not of Abraham at all. You're telling lies. It's not the truth. Because you wouldn't follow Abraham's path. In these 
Three ways Jesus shows that they are of their father, the devil. They're exactly like him. And the thing is that unbelievers manifest the same thing. You're saying here, if you don't believe tonight, you say, well, I would never murder anybody. I have no desire to kill anybody. But let me ask you, have you ever hated anybody? Have you? Have you ever hated anybody intensely? Have you ever had that inner wish to take that person out, Lord? I wish they didn't even exist. Ever felt that way? And that shows something about your heart, doesn't it? 1 John 3.15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hating. Hating is a form of murder. And of course, there's a certain way in which the believer can hate, justly hate, hate the things that the Lord hates. But we must be very careful with that emotion, that feeling, that judgment, because we are manifesting potentially the very spirit of Satan himself, murder, murderous intent. And all of it, all of it, you can see it, the, the, the original rejecter. Why, why is there resistance in your heart to not believe? Why? Who's your father? Satan. That's why you reject. That's why you resist. That's why week after week passes and you, you sit there stubbornly thinking you don't need to follow through on the word that's coming to your heart. You're manifesting the fact that you're of Satan. You're rejecting the word. That's what Satan does because there's no truth in him. And I appeal to you, my friend, if you're here and you have been rejecting the gospel to this point, listen to me. If you know deep down you're a rejecter, you're a rejecter of words. You feel resistance to some of the things we say. And people maybe have come to you and challenged, are you really saved? Are you really in Christ? Are you really born again? They wonder because they see things that trouble them, things that concern them, and you just pal it off. You just say, it's nothing. Oh, don't worry about me. I'll be all right. You're rejecting. This is what Satan does. Do you tell lies? Do you lie about the true state of your soul? Come on now, let's be honest. Do you lie about the true state of your soul? Where are you, really? Where are you? If I knew, if I only knew what was going on in your heart, if I could fix my eyes on you, drive these words into your heart with more power, but you know where you are. Does the shoe fit? You lie about where you are spiritually. This deception comes from your father, the devil. You see, for the people of God, there's no resistance. They own sin. They don't hide it. They admit these things. They freely confess that hatred is a problem and they put it under the blood. The murder is reflected sometimes from their spirit and attitude. They know at times they are resistant to the word of Christ and they are brought to repentance over it. And they know that they deceive themselves. They live in a veneer of hypocrisy and it breaks their hearts. For the child of God may go on for periods of time and they know they're living the hypocrite's life. And then they see it clearly and God brings his word and crushes them and they repent of it. They admit it. They own it. And that's the distinguishing difference. We're not divided here by those who are liars and not liars. We're all liars. And we're all hypocrites. The difference is this. The child of God owns it and puts it under the blood of Christ. Pleads for mercy. So what are you doing? What are you doing? There are few places in the Word of God where Christ speaks so harshly. 
But there are reasons for that. We are very dull of hearing. And while it's wonderful to meditate on the love of Christ and see it revealed in explicit language, let us not miss out that this is love. This is love right here. To tell, to tell one the truth, to give them what they need to hear. Spurgeon said this, if you love Jesus, you desire to be with him, and you're very glad of every opportunity of having special fellowship with him. I know if you love him, you will not be happy to live a day without him. You will feel, feel ill at ease if he is gone but for an hour. If you love Jesus, oh, how you pant for the time when you will see him face to face. You know, I read that. I wondered, do I love him? While it may be flawed, I know, I know in this heart of mine, there is a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the case for the believer here. I thought it would be flawed, Lord. I love you. I do. As some of you are just counting down the seconds. You don't love Christ. Do you do what he commands? If there's a doubt in answering that question, then ask yourself, why? Why? Why am I reluctant? Could it be I'm not saved? Is that the reason why? Do I love the ways of Satan? Do I? Do I love the ways of Satan? Doing his ways being entertained by his ways, being carnal. Maybe you think you've plenty of time, loads of time. You know, I was seeing on the news yesterday, last night in fact, 26 year old soccer player, he's from Cameroon, plays in Europe, successful playing yesterday, fit as a fiddle. He was on the pitch for seven minutes and dropped onto the pitch and went into eternity, just like that. No warning, nothing. 26, successful, healthy whole world before him, dead at 26. You see it, you can see the clip online. He's standing in the middle of the field and just drops back and that's it. And they run around the medics and they try to resuscitate and they take him in the ambulance. And he goes into the hospital for two hours, they try to work on him before they pronounce him dead just drops, just drops in the middle of a soccer game. We do not know when we're going to go into eternity. Whether at 26 or 86, no idea. This is why you must respond now. The uncertainty of the time. Not knowing the appointment that God has set for you. He doesn't tell you about it. And he's not going to. May the Lord help you to see your need. Let's bow together in prayer.